Hi, this is Dan Thomas from Dagware.com. The purpose of this tutorial is to cover the basic techniques for creating the 2.5D image effect. We'll be creating a very simple example. You can create effects that are much more spectacular than this example, but that's not the point of this tutorial. Our goal is to learn the basics. I may cover more advanced topics in other tutorials. Another thing that's not important is which tools I use in this tutorial. Even if you don't use the tools I use, you can easily take these techniques and use them with the tools of your choice. I happen to be using GIMP 2.8.10 for the Mac and Final Cut Pro X 10.1.1. You can easily accomplish the same thing using Photoshop and most any other video editing package that supports layers. This is a quick overview of the steps we'll be covering in this tutorial. I'll go over these very quickly for now. In a photo editing application like GIMP or Photoshop, we'll separate the image into at least two layers, foreground and background. More layers can produce a more convincing effect, but obviously with more work. Also, some images, like the one we're using in this tutorial, don't lend themselves to more than two layers. Once we have our multi-layer image, we bring it into our video editing application. We simulate the movement of a real-world camera by, for each layer, animating changes to scale to simulate moving the camera in or out, position to simulate panning the camera left or right, up or down, distortion to simulate orbiting the camera around the image. Or we can use a software package that supports virtual 3D camera movement, such as Apple Motion 5. The rest of this tutorial will go into details for each of these steps. When choosing an image for the 2.5D photo effect, it's always best to pick one in a higher resolution than your end result video. This is so you can avoid jagged edges. Your image should be large enough to provide room to pan around the image. However, unless you have a very high-end workstation, you don't want the resolution to be too high or to slow down the editing and animation process. So oftentimes I scale a high resolution image down. I don't have a rule of thumb to give you exact values, but these are things to consider. Now this specific image breaks those rules. It's actually smaller than the end result video. However, it's a good image for this tutorial because it's fairly easy to break apart into multiple layers. Ignore this line, it's a screen repaint issue. I have no idea why it happens. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take the original image and we're going to break it up into a foreground layer that has a transparency and the background layer. When we cut the foreground layer out, it'll make a hole in the background layer and we'll have to clean up the hole. We really only need to clean up as much of the hole as will get exposed during the animation process. Here's a little bit of an example as I move the foreground around. During the animation process, We'll probably simulate a pan of moving the camera left or right, so some of the background will get uncovered, and the area that shows is black here, that's what will have to be cleaned up. You could clean up all of it, but you don't really need to. All right, let's get started. Let's take the original image and duplicate it and make the foreground layer out of it. Make sure to add an alpha channel so it can be transparent. Now we need to cut out the background. Normally I cut out the background by hand using the Bezier tool. I found that the magic wand or the fuzzy select tool ends up producing unpredictable results with jagged edges and I often end up sorry I used it. In this particular image, the magic wand, the fuzzy select tool is, is going to work just fine, partially because it's a low resolution image. When I do use the fuzzy select tool, the first thing that I do is cut out as much of the background by hand as possible. That makes the fuzzy select tool work quicker. So now I invert the selection and delete it. By the way, in case you don't know it, in GIMP you can easily pan the image window by first selecting the image window, then by holding down the space bar and just moving the mouse while the space bar is held down, not touching any button on the mouse, just holding the space bar down and moving the mouse. Unfortunately, in GIMP there's no keyboard shortcut to select the image window. So a lot of times you'll see me click in the image window and then undo. That selects the image window. So let's talk about the fuzzy select tool or magic wand. Click on a section of the image and it selects colors that match the color you clicked based on the threshold. The lower the value, the closer the colors have to be to match. So if we lower this value and click again, it selects a smaller area. Selects a larger area. 
If you click and hold the mouse button down, you can change the threshold by dragging the mouse up and down. Watch as the selection changes as I move the mouse up and down. You can also see the threshold value changing in the box. When you release the mouse button, the selection stays and the threshold changes back to its original value. I like to keep the threshold low and drag down. It just seems to make things easier. So let's see how good we are with the fuzzy select. Everything looks pretty good all along here. All looks pretty reasonable. That all looks okay. Let's see what happens as we start going down here. It doesn't look nearly as, as complete. There's a lot of different things you can do to solve this problem. You can start with a different color. That causes the selection to react a little bit differently. But I found it's easier to break apart each area that I'm working on in, into separate sections. And that way I only have to worry about the fuzzy select selecting one little area at a time. I'll show you what I'm talking about. So let's cut out a section here. So now all we have to do is deal with this top area. We can see all along here that everything looks pretty reasonable. So we'll take that. Then we'll see that uh, we could try and do this whole thing all at once, or we can notice that the rocks here are one set of colors and the rocks are a little bit different over here. And plus I've done this before. So I know that uh, it probably is helpful to cut this little section out also. You could try it without it. That all looks pretty decent. Again, we'll, we'll clean up these little areas in a minute. Now I'm going to go in and clean up the rest of the little spots. To make it easier to see which areas have those kind of spots, we're going to change the transparency color to black. So we can see that there's a problem there, and there may be a problem over here. Let's try changing it to white. Here, that makes it a little more clear where, where the problems are. And I'm just going to use the eraser. Normally, you wouldn't want it to look as jagged as this. But that's just because of the resolution of this image. So I think we've got the foreground all finished. Now let's create the background layer. We'll duplicate the original layer and name it background. We don't need an alpha channel because we don't need transparency for the background. In fact, it's better if we don't have an alpha channel so we don't accidentally end up with some transparent areas. Now we're going to get a selection from the foreground layer. Then we'll make the background layer active. See these pixels on the head? They're technically part of the image's foreground, but they didn't make it into our foreground layer. This happens all the time, and in higher resolution images, there will be more pixels like this. So we need to grow the selection enough to cover these pixels. In this low resolution image, three pixels is enough. Now we can delete the foreground portion out of the background image. Next, we're going to fill in as much of the background hole as necessary for the animation we have planned. Always try heal selection first because when it works, it saves a lot of time. Of course, it only works some of the time. When using the Heal Selection tool, it's always best to grow the selection a little, or else you end up with lines around the edges. By the way, if you're using GIMP on the Mac and Heal Selection isn't there, or the dialog doesn't look like this, then you need to get the latest add-in. The easiest way to do this is, is to get the GIMP version of GIMP. It contains a lot of valuable add-ons and the installation process is a breeze. 
Yield selection works by sampling the pixels around the selected area and manufacturing image. I usually leave the parameters at their default, although I sometimes change sample from to sides when the image warrants it. This is often useful for skies or the ocean. In this case, it isn't necessary. On high resolution images, this can take a long time. That's another reason I scale down high resolution images to more manageable sizes. As you may be able to tell, heel selection was, well, sort of helpful. Let's take a closer look. We'll make the foreground active. And we'll drag it around a little bit and see what gets uncovered. You can see we need to clean up here and we need to clean up here. And there's some other areas we'll clean up. So to clean up the rest, we'll use the healing tool, which is similar to the heel selection tool. The difference is that with the healing tool, you choose the area to sample the pixels from and you paint over the area to be healed. I don't remember if Photoshop's healing tool works exactly the same way, but I'm sure it's close enough. I usually set the tool to 100% opacity and a brush with a hardness of 75%. By the way, GIMP has a preferences option that allows you to share brush settings between different tools. I'll show it to you. I recommend turning this off. That way, when you switch between tools, you won't get hosed. That's a technical term. To clean up an area, we command click the area we want to sample pixels from and then paint over the area to be healed. Here's a mistake that I make all the time. I have the foreground selected, so I'm actually cleaning up the foreground. It's not a good idea. Fortunately, with undo, I can go back, select the background. We'll clean it up. Generally, it's best to choose sample pixels farther away from the area to be healed, or else you get repeating patterns and that looks fake. In this case, since it all looks the same and the image is so low res, it won't matter. Close enough. Normally I don't like to repeat the same pattern like this, but I don't really think you're even going to notice it. Alright, it's not perfect, but it'll do. We can always come back and clean it up later if we need to. Make sure I put the foreground back where it belongs. And I think we're ready to start animation. We've saved the image as a Photoshop image, and I've started a new project in Final Cut. You can do this animation in other video editing software packages. Although the specific settings will be different, the concepts are the same. So now we drag the Photoshop image into Final Cut. Once the image is in our application, we want to break it apart into its layers. In Final Cut, you should be able to do this with break apart clip items, but for some reason it doesn't work in this version of Final Cut. But that's not a problem. We just double click the Photoshop file, select and copy the layers, and paste them in. We'll set the duration to 5 seconds, and we'll set them to fill the frame. So now we're ready to set the animation parameters. We'll start with the foreground layer. We're going to set the foreground layer to zoom at about 105%. That gives it enough room when we move it left and right. The background layer will do 102% because that's it doesn't need to move as much. We want to pan the foreground image over the duration of the clip. So we'll start at about minus 40 pixels offset. and pan it to zero. So if you watch the image, you can see how it moves. For the background, we're going to pan it in the other direction and we don't want to go as much. So we're going to start at 10. And we'll end at 10 in the other direction. So we're panning the foreground in one direction and the background in another direction. 
and it should look something like this. A reasonably convincing animation for this simple project. Hopefully I'll do more tutorials to show some more advanced techniques with some more complicated images at higher resolutions.